Thank you. So project modeling, I mean, it's a bit of like different words. So people call it homology modeling or molecular modeling or proto modeling. I kind of like the word homology modeling because that's what we somehow we use homo homologs. But um, I think it's, it's, it's something that we, we want to model a three dimensional model of a protein using the knowledge from other proteins. Uh, so why do we want to do this? This is the same argument as I talked about yesterday, but basically it's experimentally still rather expensive and difficult to get the structure of a, of a protein model. Protein? Yeah. And, so, and of course, sequencing is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So we are really, uh, every genome is put, puts out thousands of sequences. But uh, Structural determination has a drop in price, but it's still quite difficult. I think the average cost, I mean, they, had, they had this structural genomics initiative, they had almost factories producing structures, and I think they go down to the costs of a few hundred thousand dollars, something for structure and average, like that. But um, it really, I mean, the first GPCR, so the, the receptors that are in taste receptors and, uh, and blood is a, ma and it's a major drug, drug target. I don't know how many billions of dollars was spent before that structure was sold. And when people tried it 30 years, 40 years, I'm sure every pharmaceutical industry tried. And uh, then finally, maybe it's only five years ago, the first structures come out. And uh, so there were so certainly was billions of dollars spent on that. So it really, so. Uh, but anyway, even even if everything works, it's an easy problem to work on. It takes some time to get the structure. So we know that we have to look at the number of structures. In uh, it's increasing. So I guess this is structure section. So we have more and more structures. We have about what is no this these structures. Uh, well, this is DNA sequence certainly. Well, I don't know which one. Uh, they look the same. So basically, but even 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 the number of sequences increase by faster. Even the number of structure increase. So today we have in the order of hundred thousand. This is an old slide. slide we have in the order of hundred thousand structures in the, in the database. So they quite all structures. And there are. It was. It has been. Might have been slowing down in the last few years. But in particular, what is, has happened. It's also an old slide. Is the number of folds, the number of different structures, has not been increasing very rapidly in the last few years. So this is also an old slide looking at the number of structures, but this is the number of folds. So basically, it has been quite constant. Uh, anyway, it's, it's uh, this is the number of new folds every year. So, so basically, 90% of the structures were solved in one year was already similar to something that was already known. So basically all the GPCRs that are for salt data, they all look the same to me. I mean, you know, they certainly are doing different things, and certainly data is different, but in the overall shape, or the fold as we call it, basically if you look at something like this, like a fold of this number of beta sheets and how they're packed together, is limited. And people have been arguing how many folds exist, and there are numbers between 100 or 1,000 and maybe 10,000, but it clearly seems to be a limited number of cases. With, it might be a lot of very unique things that look different, but we don't, that, that's most likely t a few thousand probably covers at least 90% of everything we know. And But the folds also, they, they can look, actually look at these two proteins, the green and red one. Or, I mean, what is, you see, they all both have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven beta sheets. That if you put them to a top of each other, this beta sheet looks basically the same. This one has a few extra things outside, but if you take the parts that overlap with the blue and red parts here, they're almost on top of each other. While this one RC has a lot of other things around it. So it, it exists often folds that are very similar, but then it's like decorated with additional helices and things like that, and they combine in different ways. So in this case, you would assume that somehow a common ancestor of these two proteins most likely look like maybe like one of them, and then either one this one lost all these other things, or the other one 
actually gain uh, new things. This is somehow for what we argue about. But we have gaps in uh, when we do alignments. We can do an alignment of the, all these red sheets over here. But uh, uh, we we have to have insert all the green stuff. So the, the, as I said when I talked about homology, was that structure has helped to find homology. So you can see these two proteins without the secrets, most likely you don't find them. But when you have the structures and you superpose them, you can see that they're homo homo or very likely to be homologous. <coughs> so there are a couple of databases. that classify all protein structures into hierarchies. And the classical ones are, one is called SCOP and one is called CAS. SCOP was the first one and CAS was two years later. Uh, problem with this is that they have not really been, uh, they've been difficult to maintain because they are not, because they are sort of many. SCOP is actually one person basically that classifies everything. I used to. Probably, I think it's, it's three or four years old before it was lost up, last release. There's an update, to sort of update to it, that sort of uh, adds things automatically. And this CAS is more semi-manual, but even these people have, uh, they have at least some parts that are, that are a bit manual. And uh, so they are after So there's a new one database that's coming out that has been out that actually is up to date. That is based on the same ideas, but I will not talk about that. Uh, it's called ECOD. But particularly when he's talking about Scope was the first one, but I, I talked about CAS first here because it's, it's a nice web page. So in CAS and Scott, so what you have is that you divide all the protein domains into. So the first thing you need to do is you take a protein and you want to divide it into domains. I'll talk more about domains, I think, next week. Uh, but so basically, you want to take a uh, domain in this case is something that is compact and fo you could think is independently folding by itself. So it's part of, the, of a protein that is not dependent on the rest. And uh, this is actually probably the main bottleneck of when you want to do this automatically. That the, the exactly defining domain in a good way is, is quite difficult. There is also an evolutionary definition of domain that I'll talk more about also. That is basically the, the, the domains is something that is found in different combinations in different proteins. So it's like a part of a protein that can be found combined with other domains. So it's a kind of evolutionary unit. And often, but not always, do the structural and the evolutionary unit overlap. So it's the same definition. But there are there are always going to be arguments exactly with domain borders. But anyway, you divide the protein domains and then you find. Uh, Look at the structure of all proteins of one domain, and you see that this is then you then divide them into a group that could be, for instance, mainly alpha. So you have basically have is a mainly alpha helices, mainly beta sheets, or a mix. So in CAS, you have mainly alpha, and then you take all the proteins that have mainly alpha, and they are divided further into one, two, three, four, five groups here. Some of kind of orthogonal bundle, something that looks like a horseshoe. More solenoid one, and then barrel, and up and down bundle. So up and down bundle, I guess, like that. And orthogonal bundle is when they're all like this. So you have here, this is. And the barrel is more when you have a barrel like that. And then you can take the first one here, you can take the orthogonal bundle, and you can divide it into what they call um, architectures. In, in scope, it's called folds. So within groups that look the same. So for instance, you have uh, the, the Healy cases, domain three. So all these proteins, you have a representative one of the, this one up here, looks at like that. And you can look at it and it has, I think, three helices. Well, oh, this is architecture, you have one level of topology. So this is the Gloomy-like here. So they were in the last page, they were probably somewhere in there. So. So all the globins that are part of the orthogonal bundles, so the bundles that are uh, things going the same way, so, that, 
So you see here, this is typical representative. They have like one, two, three, four, five, six helices that are packed like in a bundle. And they are uh, all globins, like hemoglobin and myoglobin and things like that. And in this case, they have one, two, three, four, what's called superfamilies. So the idea here is that they all look the same, all these four family, superfamilies, but they are not necessarily evolutionary related, or they are most assumed not to be evolutionary related. There seem to be four independent innovations of something that looks very similar. This can all you can always argue about it, but it, at least that's the uh, idea of the uh, um, the authors or the curators of this database. So we basically have globins and then phagocyanins and then something called collisins and diphtheatoxin. So then within the globin family you can find a lot of proteins that are involved in oxygen transport, oxygen storage. This is hemoglobin and myoglobins. And then, of course, you can go further down within the hemoglobin family. You can go do, do, take the ones that do oxygen transport. So, the sequence family here that's called at this number and it has proteins and so on. So, scope is very similar in the idea. You have at the root, you have all alpha proteins, all beta proteins, alpha and beta. So, you basically have a division of proteins that have alpha and beta sheets mixed together and separated together, or domains that have it. Then you have a few classes here like cold calls and multiple things that are not that are categorized. I basically have four main groups. And you can do the same thing again. You can take all put it in all alpha. And you have the first group here is the globin like. It has six helices and the folded like a leaf and partly open. So the next one has only two helices and uh, has an antiparallel hairpin and so we have a number of these folds. That was called uh, topologies in CAT number no two. But it's and in many cases, of course, Scott and Kath agrees, but not always. And mainly the differences are in how you define domains. But there are also cases where, I think in this case, I think the global likes, the, the, the other one had, had the global like proteins are uh, in the same fold, and they had the superfamilies that one is global like. And if you remember in uh, Kath and the phycocyanins, was not part of the superfamily, but it was it was a separate superfamily. But here, I think the phycocyanins or phycocyanin-like ones are part of the globin-like superfamilies. So, so, so the Scott people believe that phycocyanins and globins are related, have a common ancestor, while the cat people did not believe that. So that's, I'm sure there are arguments for one way or another, but I can't say who is correct. Oh, I think actually the scope is correct in this case, but. Uh, but they have some automatics methods that they are, they are very distant. They looks very much the same, but they are very distant homologs. So they are very hard to find by homology searching. But yeah, I think you can do it. So here you have same here you have scope. You have uh, after the fold level you have superfamily level. So superfamily is basically proteins in a, that assume to have similar have a common ancestor, and then you can divide the superfamilies into families. So you have a hemoglobin families and. Uh, uh, myoglobin family, etc. So this, this of course was the first structure ever solved. Sperm whale myoglobin. Because of course you had a lot of it. A big whale, and a lot of blood, and so you have a lot of myoglobin. Not so hard to find. And just yes, to mention it, I'll talk more about it later. Is there's another database of domains it's called PFAM that I will talk about next week. It is not based on structure directly, but it's also can be used in this case. So actually, this E code is very much based on PFAM, but using structures. Okay, so the first thing, so, so we, we know that structures can be similar, in particular, look at the domain levels. Can we use this for modeling a structure then? So, yes, we can. So, and it all somehow depends on how similar the protein or the model is to a template or a target. So basically you have a template in your database with known structure and you want to find this template or even multiple templates 
and then you want to make an alignment and you want to build a model. And this is just an experience basis for how good the models could be. So if you, you can test this, of course, if you have known examples. So if you, and a very good indicator how good the model is going to be is basically the sequence identity or, or the similarity in score between the target and the template. And uh, uh, there are course two reasons why the, the model gets less good when you have a lower sequence identity. And one is of course that you actually make less good alignments, you make more mistakes. But secondly also because of course most likely the structures are more different. And basically what you're doing here is basically copying the co coordinates. I mean, I mean, there's a few other things to do also, but in principle copy the coordinates of one to that one. So the both of them we actually are doing less good alignments, but it's also that the actual structure of course is not identical for two homology products, but they are similar. So here just compared to, I guess, for the people who take, take took the structure of course, if you look at something that is more than 60% secret identity, then you will have very, very few gaps in your alignments. So you start having gaps maybe about 50% secret identity in most of the cases. And you, at least, if this is just the backbone, but basically on top of which there might be some small differences in some low pair somewhere, but it's basically almost identical in most cases. If you are somewhere between 30 and 60%, these are things that are very easy to detect with BLAST or whatever. Whatever simple homology hom structure program finds them and, <coughs> and alignments is rather easy. They are often maybe one or two gaps, but they are often in some loops somewhere. So this is the, but the rest of it is straight on. But you start seeing that it actually, st even the backbone starts varying a little bit, in particular in this region down here, when there might be a gap, and this loop is different. And the, uh, even more up here, this loop actually. This loop seems to be completely different. So, of course, putting in loop regions, you might get wrong things. And of course, uh, if the active site is here, you want to model the active site, you want to model how the drug binds there, the model can be completely useless. So, for, for and then if you go further down, the models are more different. But it's, so far, this overall shape is correct, but certainly a lot of fragments move around much more, etc. So, it all depends on, it depends on what you want to model. So, so, so the useful of these models are really uh, how you can, uh, what you want to use for them. So this is the same models we have, another view. And I guess the correct structure in this case is the ye yellowish green one, the model is the red one. So basically if you want to make if you have something here, the model is 0.4 angstrom. So one angstrom is basically the length of a bond between two atoms. So an average or half a bond length off for the, uh, I guess, the backbone or the alpha cell. And a uh, model that is also, it basically can be useful for most things. You might, if you really want to have make an uh, optimization of a drug, uh, something, it might not be good enough. It really depends on how the binding site is conserved and if the results are changing. But in general, for most things, it's as good as you get from an experimental model. Somewhere in, in between, of course, you start having, then you have to be careful. I mean, you're going to have some mistakes here, and maybe some loop regions, and you're going to model that good. Then, of course, where you can try to improve it by doing better models. But, uh, and uh, you might start having small alignment problems, but not that is quite easy. In this region, of course, you need to make sure you do things correct. And certainly, in the structures are starting to start to look differently. And you see, it's even here, it's like even some part is missing that you model extra that you don't have, and there are some parts that are shifted, etc. So it's not it's not a perfect model, but still, it's only one long stream off. So it's still, um, but I would say a very good model. It's supposed to look the same to me. So this. It's basically the I mean, same information as we had before. Actually, it's, it's the same type of plot as they use in PhD, as I showed you earlier. So basically, we have sequence identity, and also you have the length into a, a fraction that is covered by alignment. So if you're over some kind of curve that looks something like this, 
you can make a good model. If it's below it, you make a good model. So, so if you have 10 residues identical, it doesn't really say as of one, or 10% of the product is identical, even if it's 100 identical, it doesn't say so much. But if you have 10% of the signal identity at the, all the proteins, you, you can say a lot. And even 20%, people used to talk about what they call it, the twilight zone of homolium modeling. This is the same plot again in another way. It's based on when you have uh, uh, regions that are less than 20% identical and uh, covering. You, you, so, sort of difficult. But n nowadays, I will talk a bit about later, we are much better at making alignments than we used to be. In particular, that's because we have much bigger sequence generators. So, we can do much better alignments. So we are actually, even down if you only have 5 or 10 percent, 6 percent entity, you can often make a very good model. So what, what do you do? So as I said, you need an alignment. So in a simple case, you have something like this. You have a template, you have a sequence, you align your sequence with this template, and you assume that if this is a Y here, I, I just take the coordinate of that part, and I get some kind of framework here <coughs> that is deposited the line. And I just copy the coordinates. That's the backbone. I just ignore the side chain to start with. <coughs> and then you see I have some parts, like particularly these loop regions, that are well, sometimes I have insertions and sometimes I have deletion of templates. But sometimes well, it doesn't fit perfectly. So, so some, some, some residues I don't have any corners for. And some are, I have two residues that are. That are Far away from each other, but it had to be close. But for chemical reasons, they had to, should be next to each other because there is a bond between them. So I take my framework and ignore kind of these loop regions that I have gaps, and I try to model these in some other way. And then I try to build the side chains. So often a method works something like this you detect a template using BLAST or side BLAST or uh, something like that. That. And this is quite fast because you don't search the whole database. You search only the known structures. There's only 100,000 proteins in there. So it's very fast searching. You get alignment. And, and this is really key information. So if you don't get a good alignment, you will not have a good model. And nowadays, often you have methods that can use more than one alignment or more than one template. Because often lot, lot, you have structures from many families. and. If you use them all together, you can make better models. And then you want to replace all the side chains, because of course, every position you have mutation, the side chain is going to be different. But you also, normally, if the structure, you want to keep as much information as possible from your, from your template. So if, you, if, the, if the side chain is the same, or if the side chain is similar, you, so it's more or less the same length, you keep as much as you can from it. Because that's most likely to be correct. Uh, and then you need to insert, insert uh, loop regions, particularly when you have deletions and insertions. In the parts where we have gaps in the model, you need to fix them, building new loops or things like that. And then, of course, you, need, you want to do some kind of refinement. You want to do, make sure you don't have atoms on top of each other, or you want to make sure that you don't have uh, uh, bonds that are not that are too far from each other, etc. And you, a part of this is fine because you have some kind of method to evaluate the model, and then you want to iterate this a number of times. From a practical point of view, the key is that really no model can uh, correct an incorrect uh, alignment. Well, this one. Picture is really more example. This is exemplified here. So really, assuming you have a beta sheet with kind of a, a um, loop here, so you have the, this this uh, this is your sequence and this is the structure. So basically, you have one, two, three hydrogen bonded things. And I mean, that means quite easy. But then you have a, this one has one re extra residue. So, of course, you know that this residue basically, say you have the same yellow type of residue there and there. 
So you can basically make two different alignments. You can have this alignment here, here, or here, here. The, from alignment point of view, they're identical. But when you're looking at structure, this is not an optimal way to make a model if you, made a, if you have this alignment, because you're really going to have a bulge out of a beta strand here. But if you, on the other hand, move this alignment one step, you just make this loop a bit longer, which is, makes much more sense. So, and there's no way that if you start with this alignment, if you start with model, that any method really could fix it. Because the, the, the key thing here is that you try to keep as much as possible from the, from the template. So that's why it's crucial to have the correct alignment. So there are, so you could, you could of course, iteratively try to um, move your gap positions to fit in different places. So you can, uh, uh, oh, so this is just, uh, I guess the green one here is the template structure. The blue one and the red one are the same thing, but two different alignments. So in one case, we make a gap here, and in another case, we make a gap here. And from uh, an alignment point of view, it doesn't really matter, because there's three in the pro line. Uh, well, this is probably looking better, like a better alignment, because the pro line aligned to the pro line. It looks like it's like slightly worse alignment from a from a sequence perspective. But if you look at the structure, you see that the red one, if you make this model, you have to close this long, long gap between these two positions here. Otherwise, you will not close this small gap. So the, the second one would have been a better alignment. But it's from a sequence perspective, that is not really, they will have a lower score. Because you don't have this program program match. So there are tricks, you, know, you, you can play around with the loop regions and things like that. Often nowadays the thing, difference is that if you really make a good side blast or multiple sequence alignment, you can often solve this problem somehow, because they often solve automatically. But if you look at one sequence, one template, that's not, no, that's not the case. Another factor, actually, when you start looking for templates is that often you want to have a high resolution template. So if you have a template that is, so in crystallography you measure the quality of your data that is used for mod making a model, your protein structure, in the resolution. So that's basically how much data you have. So lower resolution is, means higher quality. So in this case you would take uh, at uh, 9% identity, that's like lower identity, but has a higher resolution, you will use that instead. But that's because three and a half function model are, I mean, it's going to have uh, some errors in side chains and things like that, it's not going to be as accurate to model, most likely. So, uh, often you end up with having a conserved core, so you basically, most conserved can just copy it, the structure, but you want, you want to fix the, the loops later, this is just an example. And one way that some methods use to find loops is basically, is that you use fragments. So in, if you have this alignment here, you see you need to insert five residues here. So what you take is you take maybe two residues on each side of this loop, cut out this part here, so you take this nine, this four residues over here, and you take this nine residue, and then this nine residue fragments, and you look at the database of all other known structures for methods that are, uh, where these two residues, or these four residues are, are, are arranged like that, and you have five residues in between them. And ideally it seems as sequence composition also than that, but that's not necessary. So you can do that and you can search for things that are like going through all possibilities. And you find the number one that, that, that match more or less well and you can then have some score and find it to pick one whatever works best to do. Or, or try whatever it doesn't collide with the rest of the etc. and so on. Of course, yes intuitively, this works quite well for short loops. If you have a long loop, it's less likely that you find something that looks the same in the database. So for loops, maybe up to 
Sen röst du kan vara upp eller flera rum på kvällen för det är ju något fint. Annars gör jag sånt i mitt hälsa med lärt. Så det alternativ metod i samma vanligt metod är istället för att generate the loops automatically. Så du kan ha en library of small fragments and you start with one position and then start the next position and you try to build up this together until you have something that looks like a loop. So yeah, mm. as I said, this is a if the loop length here somewhere in the order nine ten residues. You actually have good. This is the difference in the closest hit in the database for loops of different lengths, and you see that on average at nine residues you find it seems to be going up quite well. So you get a bunch of things, but of course there are cases where you find longer loops also in some cases. And a similar idea with side chains. If you can copy as much as possible from the template. So if it's if you have a tryptophan in the template, use the tryptophan confirmation. Uh, if it's partly similar, so for instance, one your side chain is slightly longer, you keep as much as possible and uh, you build a side chain. And of course if it's completely different, you have to take you have to look at all possible root domains or all so you have a database of all possible sidechain confirmations and you take the one that fits best. And there are actually, I don't think I will uh, talk about it today, but there are actually methods that are quite good at rebuilding sidechains from a backboard. So if you take the backboard of your structure and you want to rebuild all the sidechains, this is of course, you can imagine it should be an empty complete problem, you should really combine all different methods, but it's you can actually quite efficiently break down into small parts. So you can uh, rebuild most of the side chain in the center of the core almost perfectly if you have the perfect backbone. So there are quite fast methods to do that. Okay, I think I'll make a break here and I'll keep on talking about more about alignment methods. So I'm talking about Swiss, pro Swiss model, but I need to have a coffee first. Mm -hmm.